Hi, I'm Paul Beck with uh, University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology and uh, Carleton University um, Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. And basically I'd like to try to come up with some sort of summary on what this um, USGS, the United States Geological Survey, uh, review paper on the potential of methane coming up into the atmosphere and affecting climate um, from being sourced basically from methane hydrates, frozen methane hydrates in the sediments on the seafloor and also on land underneath the permafrost. So <coughs> the main conclusions are that yes, present day on our planet, because of the rapid warming that's occurred, we're getting gas hydrates dissociating um, in response to post last glacial maximum climate change and probably also due to warming since the onset of the industrial age so so since uh, you know 1750 onward and as temperatures rise more rapidly as the Arctic warms much more rapidly we'll, we get more methane coming up but according to this review paper there's not conclusive proof at the moment that the release methane entering the atmosphere at a level that's detectable against the background of 555 teragrams per year methane emissions. And this, is, this number is derived from both bottom up or, or, or bottom up and top down uh, methods. Um, now the IPCC estimates are not based on direct measurements of methane fluxes from dissociating hydrates because they haven't been measured, been able to measure them. So um, there's lots of models to uh, look at this. And uh, so, you know, we have to have, we know what the distribution of the hydrates is. We know, uh, you know, what to expect in, in terms of the sources from, you know, warming, you know, also from the pressure differences, but the actual sinks of the methane have not been fully accounted for according to this review paper, and they're a lot larger than we thought before, and the amount of methane that's in the hydrates is less than we originally thought. It's not 11,000 gigatons of carbon, it's more like 1,800 gigatons per carbon. So, um, also, okay, so these sinks are in the sediments themselves where you have anaerobic oxidation of methane, based on, you know, just under the seafloor, under the surface of the sediments, in the sulfur, um, sulfur mediated zone. Then you get the bubbles going into the water column and as they rise up, you get some of the methane gas is dissolved into the actual water. Um, and when it's dissolved into the water, uh, depending on the depth, then you get aerobic, uh, decomposition of the methane um, and so these sinks can be very large um, unless you have episodic uh, releases of methane which then saturate out the sinks and bypass get through the sinks so what is what are the risks of that happening um, and that's the you know the, the big question but according to this analysis of all of the knowledge that risk is probably being overblown according to this particular paper and i'm just really the messenger on this you know this paper has just come out and i'm trying to get my head around it i have to read it a lot more and figure out what's going on to see you know what makes sense and what doesn't make sense read all the references etc um okay so so basically, the um, you know there there needs to be you know science can only tell you so so much, right? Um, in order to make you know when you have an episodic pulse of something, you know it's very very difficult for science to say much more than that the risk of this event happening is getting much larger. Trying to put boundaries on the risk based on you know what's happened in the past but for science to come out and say you know that there's absolutely going to be a huge uh, episodic you know 
50 gigaton release, which is going to take down civilization. I mean, it just can't say that. It, it, it's, you know, uh, it can say that the probability of that happening is very low. It's increasing. Uh, this is what we've seen in the past, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, let's look at, in summary, some of the key points of this paper. And the key point is that the more modern view of um, basically the amount of carbon trapped in global gas hydrate deposits is something more like 1800 gigatons of carbon as opposed to the view from the late 80s which was higher 11,000 gigatons of carbon and this was assuming that a lot of the gas hydrate stability zone around the planet was occupied by methane. The gas hydrate stability zone is the zone where methane can exist in frozen hydrate form and be stable, but you still have to have a methane source for it to get there in the first place. So because a lot of those regions don't have methane, um, or the methane concentration is lower, then this is a number that is believed to be much more accurate. This is the methane in the atmosphere, the sources of methane in the atmosphere. Um, lots from wetlands and agriculture and fossil fuels and biomass burning, geological here, you know, other parts of the pie, but the amount from permafrost and gas hydrates is believed to be fairly low at the moment. But these numbers are rapidly rising and how quickly they rise is, you know, is, is a real money question. Um, this particular plot shows, you know, we've got the seafloor dropping off here uh, we've got so much methane going up into the atmosphere globally, you know, how much is coming from the sediment, how much gets through the anoxic um, breakdown um, of, of uh, anoxic uh, breakdown of methane in the sediment, how much gets in the water column, how, much, how far up do the bubbles go before they dissolve. And uh, when you get the dissolved methane in the water column, how much is broken down by the, by the aerobic processes, okay? How much gets into the atmosphere? Um, how long does it last in the atmosphere? You know, there's all of these different questions. Um, here's the bubbles, that, the bubble diameter. So it depends on the depth at which the methane's released as to whether anything gets up into the atmosphere. If it's too deep, nothing gets up. And as you get, you know, larger and larger bubbles, um, then it takes longer for them to dissolve and they're moving up, moving faster, obviously. So uh, when you get larger and larger bubbles and more gets up into the, the uh, atmosphere. Um, this is showing some of the different sources of the methane. You have uh, thermogenic methane, so this is a conventional natural gas, you know, meth methane, which is obtained from fracking, you know, it's deep down. Um, you have different permafrost and coal seams, coal bed methane, uh, gas hydrates that are dissociating. You have uh, modern microbial near the surface from thawing, you know, releasing methane, microbial from, from previously frozen carbon that's deeper down. Okay, you have all these different sources, but those are still considered fairly low compared to what we're getting from wetlands and, and uh, fossil fuel emissions, etc. <coughs> this is another view of the gas hydrate stability zones under the ice sheets in the high Arctic under thermocast karst lakes, um, the, the methane on the shallow Arctic shelves on the, uh, ma the major slope, um, the steeper slope going down. There's different stability zones uh, because you need high pressure and cold temperatures. And then the methane that's released in the sediments is broken down by the anaerobic oxidation. Bubbles go in the water column. The bubbles get smaller as they rise up because some of the gas gets dissolved into the water. Um, once it's dissolved in the water, it's broken down by aerobic uh, processes. Um, some of it, you know, if this is ha happening at a shallower distance, then you get methane going up into the atmosphere, and then you have to look at the breakdown of the methane um, by the hydroxide and et cetera. 
and then there's also methane that is underneath the ice sheet. So as we lose the Greenland ice sheet and Antarctic ice sheet, um, then there's as there's more runoff underneath and so on, then that methane can get into the atmosphere system. So there's all of these different processes that are occurring. So basically, you know, in summary from this paper, um, you the up to now, um, and this has just come out February 8th, um, basically the, according to this review paper anyway, um, the, uh, the risks of, you know, a large episodic pulse of methane hydrate is, uh, needs to be looked at more carefully because these sinks, um, that I've described are larger, um, than what we would have expected. So, you know, as in a, with a general warming and a general overall emission of methane from all over different sources in the Arctic, you know, a lot of that methane is going to not make it into the atmospheric system, of course, unless there's, you know, a uh, Sterega type landslide and a big pulse of methane released, or unless there's, uh, you know, huge breakdown of the Greenland and Antarctic glaciers, and there's methane underneath there that is released a lot. Um, so this is, uh, you know, methane is obviously a risk and it's obviously a powerful feedback. Um, if you buy this paper, the risk is not as great as we may have thought, but you no, know, I still stand by my claim that we're in a global climate change emergency. You know, the warming in the Arctic, the, um, r the, the rapid rises in greenhouse gas emissions and the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, both from CO2 and methane, it's coming from somewhere you know, wetlands, you know, as, as our world is warming and getting wetter, um, you know, wetlands are expanding, you know, other areas are decreasing, you know, you've got to look at the overall picture and try to figure out what's happening. Um, you know, I think the feedbacks from the jet stream waviness, you know, are equalizing temperature in the Northern Hemisphere, and we're obviously going to be losing uh, Arctic sea ice completely in several years. And you know, all, I mean, there's no discussion in this paper about these type of effects, about, you know, overall temperature rise on methane, you know, modeling, that type of thing. So there's a lot of things that this paper um, doesn't cover and misses. It's just, it just focuses on the methane. Anyway, um, you know, it's a lot of material to get your head around. I hope I've helped and you can go to the original source and you know, read the paper. Hopefully I've given some sort of overview of it. So thanks for listening.